Well, we've been going through this this Lenten season with the Relent theme that we've joined some other churches to do, and um, we've this is the fourth week, and we're talking today about ambition. And you know, it struck me as I started working on this, humans have a strange way of kind of determining what our place is. Remember in, in high school, or uh, not too many high school kids in the room, but high school and junior high, you guys can still remember that far, right? And, and what it was like with the different social groups, and you know the grading system that, that you have in high school and junior high, and there's like the, the really cool kids, you know, they're the nines and the tens, and they're athletic, and they got stuff, they're wealthy, and they're, you know, just so cool, and, uh, you know, that just sets them apart. And then there's the next group that's like seven and eights. We don't, you don't really use those numbers, but you know who you are, right? And, you know, a seven or eight might smile at the cool guy in the hall, but, you know, it's, you don't dare go sit down at their table because they just make fun of you and you'd be humiliated. So you stay among your own kind. You all remember, aren't you glad you're not in high school anymore? Remember those days of having your little group of people and you're all, you know, within a point of each other and that's just kind of how you function? It doesn't seem fair, but most of us learn that system and we kind of accept our, quote, lot in life and we learn to not try to get out of that too much. Uh, we may dream of that big break of, you know, making a number up or somebody acknowledging that, you know, we are really somebody even though we're in a, a, a system or a class a couple below them. A few years ago, um, I walked onto uh, one of the better golf courses here in town, and uh, I wasn't planning on playing golf that day, but um, I decided, well, it's, it's a nice day, and I got, the, got free time, so I'll go play that course. I usually play it two or three times a year. So uh, they're usually booked up if you don't call in on Monday morning. And they were. They were booked up and walked into the pro's office and said, you know, do you have any spots? He says, you know, we've got one opening down on the tee right now. There are three guys just getting ready to tee off. If you're willing to play with them, you know, run down there. You'll be okay. Those are good guys. They play here all the time. So I got my bag and ran down to the first tee and um, when it comes to golf, I'm, I'm a five golfer, <laughs> okay? You laugh. None of, there, there, might, there might be some sixers or sevens in the room. I don't know. But a five golfer usually isn't embarrassed. You don't do anything so stupid that you embarrass yourself. But nobody on the golf course that has clubs is looking at a five golfer and going, I want to be like him. Right. They, they kind of look at your swing and they go, I don't know how he gets the ball down there with that swing, but it happens. So we'll just, you know, take that. I got to the first tee and these three guys, I could tell by the looks of their clubs and their bags and the clothes they had on and the way they were warming up. They were sevens, no doubt about it. And as they introduced themselves, I found out one of them was an eight or a nine because he had been a pro golfer for a while and then had a car accident and had to leave the tour. And that's who they put me in with, were these sevens and at least an eight. You know, so I'm like, oh, you know, over the ball. They hit, and, and it went pretty well for them. You know, they were a little disappointed because it didn't quite make the middle of the fairway and stuff like that. But I was over the ball, and I was like, Lord, please just let me hit the ball. Lord, I just want to... <laughs> I don't want to miss the ball completely, you know, because this eight and these two sevens are watching me. And I did okay. I mean, it wasn't spectacular, but I did all right. And I didn't embarrass myself right away. Um, <laughs> I played with them, and it was obvious that they were better. And they were, you know, sevens will play with a five because, you know, he's a five and he needs some help. And they were they were being nice to me and and, you know, I wasn't, as long as I didn't hurt anybody or, uh, you know, take too much time for them having to look at my ball. But as the day went on, uh, it, you know, I was holding my own for a while. My my drives weren't that good and my approaches weren't good, but I was putting pretty good and, and um, making up for it. And um, it just, you know, that old high school thing came back and I just started looking at them and, and how good their swings were and where, they're, you know, where they were placing the ball and how they were working the ball and all this stuff. And I started thinking about myself a lot. And as the day progressed, it just got worse and worse and worse. 
And it got so bad that after a while, I would go to the tee box and I started slicing the ball really bad. Those of you that play golf, you know what that is. And, and uh, it just goes, you know, OB over there. And as, as the day progressed, they finally just got, so I'd come up to the tee box and they would just kind of turn their backs to me. They didn't even want to see what I was hitting, you know, and talk kind of whisper to each other, you know, because they didn't even want to look at what that was like. And by the time that I, we got to about 15 or 16, I was, my prayer changed a lot. I was like, Lord, uh, tsunami, <laughs> you know, or uh, lightning strike, you know, just a small meteor over there, you know, just, just something to get me out of this, you know, because it was just, mm. And I got home and, you know, I told Nine, I said, it's, it's going to take me weeks for me to get this taste out of my mouth. I'm going to remember this. And I just felt like a little boy, you know. Actually, they called me a little girl, but I felt like a little boy, you know. I was humiliated. And, you know, my, I just realized that you're taking all your identity off of these guys because in all sports, you're not supposed to worry about how good the other guy is or girl is. You're supposed to play your game, and especially in golf. But I wasn't playing my game. I was playing their game. And I went from a five to a four to a three to a two to, you know, take his clubs away from him and send him home is where I went. Ambition is so strange. I mean, it really is. It's in, in and of itself, it's not bad. Synonyms for ambition are words like dream or hope, desire, purpose. And the, the absence, the opposite of ambition is apathy. I just don't care. I don't want to do that. And ambition in and of itself is not bad. We should, we should dream and we should hope and we should have purpose. And when ambition is missing, it's just a life that's wasted. I just don't care. A life without purpose, a life without goals. So we instill it early in our kids, don't we? We tell them even when they're three or four, you've got to study. You've got to learn. You know, you're going to be somebody. You're one of the smartest kids. You're one of the most athletic kids. You know, you're, you've got one of the greatest personalities. And they go, but dad, I'm just a five. We go, no, you're not. You get out there. You're a 10, kid. Get out there and, and work on your jump shot. You're, you, you know, you're not a five. You're not a four. You, you're really somebody. You're my son. Hopefully, we all have some ambition. Apathy is a killer. And to just sit and wait for what's going to happen to you, to not have any dreams or any purpose or goals. And God has given us ambition, and we have hopes, and we have dreams. And some of us know them pretty well. You know, I'm going I'm to work out five hours a day until I look like that. I, I've got a lot of drive in me. I'm going to work as many hours as it takes in order to work my way up the ladder, you know, and to get a better job so I can do some things for my family. Or, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to buy the Rosetta Stone and eat at Taco Bell so, till I learn Spanish. You know, we have ambitions and goals and drives, and I'm going to work two jobs and save my money so I can get enough to buy that, that first house. Ambition's a good thing. And when the object of the ambition is the correct object, is it a good thing? But it all depends on the object. When the object of ambition is, is not good, ambition becomes a, just a terrible master, and it steals life away from us. As we have been going through Lent experience, we, we looked at the, the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. And uh, this is why we have Lent 40 days long, is because Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days. Oh, by the way, if you didn't know, some of you, I, I don't think do. Maybe you didn't read the book all the way through. Uh, actually, from Ash Wednesday to Easter is more than 40 days. I think it's 47 days. Sunday is not a part of Lent. Sunday's not a fast day. Sunday's a feast day. Wow, some of you are already thinking, you know, what am I going to do this afternoon? I didn't know that. Why didn't they tell me this up till now? But anyway, we remember that right after Jesus was baptized, that he, he uh, came up out of the water and this voice said, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. And then the Spirit led him out into the, to the desert where he was tempted for 40 days. And Satan came to him with these three temptations. And last week we looked at appetite. This week we look at the second one, which we're calling ambition. Matthew 4, 5 to 7. After that, the devil brought him into the holy city and stood him at the highest point of the temple. 
And he said to him, Since you are God's son, throw yourself down, for it's written, I will command my angels concerning you, and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. And Jesus replied, Again, it's written, Don't test the Lord your God. Now, let me fill in just a few things here. It says that he took him to the pinnacle of the temple. And in our American minds, what we're probably picturing here is First Baptist Church with a great big steeple and Jesus and the devil up there on that steeple like that. And that's not really the way it is, you know. The temple, it says... Uh, when it says temple, it means the whole temple mount. And the temple proper was a very small building, not very big at all. The temple mount was three football fields. And more than likely where Satan took Jesus was to the top of what's called Solomon's Portico, which was kind of this huge mall area on the temple mount. And it overlooked the Kidron Valley and looked towards the Garden of Gethsemane. And it would have been about 400, 400 feet above uh, the Kidron Valley, so it's a great distance up. And Satan takes him up there, and there's Jesus looking over this great expanse, and Satan says, jump! I dare you! <laughs> you think you're somebody. You, you, you think that you're the Son of God. Well, prove it. Jump off! Come on, double dog dare you, Jesus. Jump off of the top of this, and, and uh, the angels will will save you and you'll be somebody and everybody will go, oh, surely he's God because look, he jumped and the angels came and, and caught him. And, you know, people want to see a show. Prove that you're really God. Be cool. Be a 10. It's important on each one of these three temptations that Satan quoted scripture, he, on each one of them, leaves something out or twists the context just a little bit and, of course, Jesus fought the, the temptation back with Scripture. Satan quotes Psalm 91, 11 to 12, which is a protection psalm. And if it is a psalm of protection, and Satan uses this promise to tempt Jesus to make God prove himself. And it's the same temptation, I think, that he would face later when he's on the cross. And those at the foot of the cross says, if you're really the Messiah, then come down from there. That was always the temptation of Jesus, is to, is to miss the cross. Take, take an easier way off of the cross. Don't really do that. So come down from there. And they, they wanted constantly a famous Messiah, um, someone who would you know sign autographs and, and they could buddy up with, and they would know that there's someone because they know him. And they wanted a Messiah with some ambition, some ambition to be somebody. And they wanted someone they could carry on their shoulders to the streets. And he would be an Alexander the Great or a you know, Caesar Augustus kind of guy. But at all costs, they wanted him to avoid the cross, to avoid the suffering, avoid the sacrifice by becoming relevant and famous. So we read the Gospels, there are many places where the disciples, his own chosen twelve, these twelve men who knew him so well, lived with him for three years in and out, and they do the same thing. They go over and over, is this the time of your kingdom? Is it here? Is it here yet? Is, is now the time when you're going to reveal who you really are? And, you know, you're not this... this low-down Nazareth guy that's, that's going to suffer, but, but you're really the mighty Messiah like this great ruler. Is this the time? As a matter of fact, it was just um, after Jesus had been resurrected and was with his disciples, it says, for 40 days teaching them and revealing himself to them in his resurrected body. Think about that. They were with Jesus for 40 days in his resurrected body. And at the end of that, it says in Acts 1, that he's getting ready to leave, and he says, I want you guys to wait here in Jerusalem because you're going to receive the power of the Spirit when you wait here, and, and you're going to change the world. And you know what they say to him? They go, is this the time of your kingdom now? Is this it? You see, they, they never get it. It's, it's not until the Holy Spirit is really in them do they begin to understand the humility of God and the identity of God to them. They would, they thought, well, you know, 
maybe you would be a great uh, leader, and if he had come down from that pinnacle or come down from that cross, he would have been a great prophet. He would have had statues erected for him, and um, he would be a great man. His tomb would be a place where they would visit, and it would become a, a huge tourist attraction. But there would be a body in that tomb because he would not be the Son of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I am often tempted by ambition. I try to be somebody. I'm not proud of that, but I'm often tempted. I, I, I want to have my name remembered. I, I have to admit that. I, I doubt if there's anybody in this room that wants to have your name forgotten. And on, the, on my worst days, I dream of being a 10, uh, a little notch higher at least than what I am. And I, maybe I don't want to be famous, but I, I want to be somebody. I don't want to be forgotten. And like it or not, we are destined to be forgotten. Here comes the bad part of the sermon. We're destined to be forgotten. Each and every one of us are destined for obscurity. Um, there's no way we can do anything about it. Uh, fame is always fleeting. And what we do in this world stays in this world. And this world is passing away. And I know that's not a nice word. Uh, it's true. We might as well embrace it. It's reality. In Psalm 103, uh, 15 and 16, it says, Our days on earth are like grass, like wildflowers. We bloom and die. The wind blows and we're gone as though we had never been here. I mean, that's a real bummer, isn't it? As though we had never been here. I think that's perhaps the, the most depressing place is to visit an old cemetery. Uh, last summer we were doing some... Uh, looking for some old uh, ancestors of ours, and we knocked around some cemeteries. And to see a cemetery, a, a tombstone with the name 150 years old, and you can barely read it, and it's on an angle or broken, and the, the grave is unkept, and, and you realize it's probably been 100 years since flowers were placed on this grave. This person has become just anonymous. And, and in that grave is a life of some man who probably gave his time and his energy to buy a piece of ground. And with that ground, he worked that ground for his lifetime to, to build a house and then a bigger house for his family and to give things to his children. And he dreamed of being somebody his whole life. And what he got out of it was his name written in the paper just one time on his obituary. And now here he is, and he's just dust. It's a bummer, isn't it? <laughs> but it's reality. That's, that's who we are, from dust to dust. It's the way of people. It's reality. It's reality that the world denies. The reality is, is that we are born into obscurity. The ambitions of this world make us think that we have done something or created something that's going to last, but it's all going to turn to dust in this world. And I stress once again that ambition is not bad when it's ambition directed to the right object, but... What we are constantly tempted with is a temptation to do something remarkable, to become famous, to, as we say, be somebody. Today, being famous is a highly desired goal in our culture. As a matter of fact, the younger you are, the more popular it is. Pew Research did uh, research to 18 and 25-year-olds, and they listed the following is their top goal in life. Number one, be rich. 81% of them said yes. That's the number one thing I want to be is rich. But the second one was be famous. A little over half, 51% of them said I want to be famous. Of course, they think those two things go together. Number three, help people who need help. Just 33, just 30%. 30 be leaders in their community. 22% and become more spiritual. 10%. Now, I realize that when we're all uh, 18 to 25, our goals may not be quite fully formed yet. I'm not wanting to come down on that generation. I'm not sure it's any worse than my generation would have been at that age. But that's reality. We live in a culture where people will do almost anything just to, to touch someone that's famous. Justin Timberlake's half-eaten French toast sold for $3,000. Somebody paid $3,000 for a half-eaten piece of French toast of Justin Timberlake. They say, well, that's stupid, right? Huh, wait. <laughs> Exhale breath of Brad Pitt and Angelia Jolie, a jar, 
supposedly containing the bad breath of Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. $500 somebody paid for that. You can't see it. You can't ever open it up. You lose it. But inside the exhale breath. Uh, chewed gum, Britney Spears, $160. A lock of Justin Bieber's hair. Now you guys are going to get in the bidding, some of you. Um, $40,668. $40,000 for a lock of Justin's hair. Tissue. A snot rag by Scarlett Johansson sold for $5,300. Can't even reuse it. I mean, <laughs> this is ridiculous, right? But that's the culture in which we live. We look at those extremes and we go, well, that's not me. Of course it's not me. But all around us, people are yelling, jump! You know, I got you. Jump, go ahead, don't go viral. This is going to be fantastic. You know, you, the hits you're going to get on this. The followers that are going to get on your tweet thing, you know. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands. You, you're going to go from obscurity to somebody and just one action, right? That's the soup in which we live. And that's what we hear is jump. Now there's another object of ambition, uh, though, that's healthy and produces lasting results, results that don't uh, end with this world. We are called to follow Christ. And that's what, why we call ourselves Christ followers. I'm trying purposely to use the word Christian less and less these days. Simply because Christian, to me, kind of denotes that you've joined a club. Christ followers mean that you're following someone. I'm not sure that Christian does to most people today. It's kind of a, a word that's set in history. It's more about yesterday. But Christ follower means that where he goes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to observe, I'm going to listen, and I'm going to go there. And Christ leads us into an ambition, he does, of pleasing God. And following Him, seeking His kingdom. The kingdom of God is not of this world, which means that it's drastically different than the kingdoms of this world. The kingdoms of this world say, toot your own horn, right? Write your own press release, is what the kingdoms of this world say. They say, demand to be first in line. You're somebody. If they don't know it, tell them that you're somebody. And you're only anybody or somebody if you say that you are. Do something to establish yourself as being with the tens and the nines and the tens. If you've got to steal or lie or cheat or whatever, that's okay. Because you see, the object of life is to become somebody like that. And everybody knows that you're somebody. That's the kingdom of this world. And as Jesus said, the kingdom is passing away. This world is passing away. For most of us in this room, I hope that that world has already passed away, that we realize that that's not my identity in life. For the follower of Christ, the kingdom has already passed away. For the follower of Christ doesn't need fame. We don't need somebody to tell us that we're somebody. We know that we're somebody. Because God tells us in our heart that we're somebody. There's a passage of scripture you probably haven't paid any attention to. I hadn't until recently. It's John 7, 1 to 10. It's a neat story. And it just speaks to this about following Christ so much and where he's going it says, after this, Jesus traveled throughout Galilee. He didn't want to travel in Judea, that's the south, because the Jewish authorities wanted to kill him. When it was almost time for the Jewish festival of booths, and that's what they had there in Jerusalem, Jesus' brothers said to him, leave Galilee, go to Judea, so that your disciples can see the amazing works that you do. Those who want to be known publicly don't do things secretly. Since you can do these things, show yourself to the world. His brothers said that because even they didn't believe in him. Jesus replied, for you any time is fine, but my time hasn't come yet. The world can't hate you. It hates me, though, because I testify that its works are evil. You go up to the festival. I'm not going to this one because my time hasn't come yet. Having said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers left for the festival, he went too, not openly, but in secret. His brothers come to him. They want to launch his campaign, right? They want to push him off the top. 
They say, man, get out there and, and make something of yourself. This healing thing you got going is really cool. It's really working. If this catches on down in Jerusalem, you're going to really be somebody, but you're never going to be anybody up here in Galilee, up here in farmland. You need to get down there to the big city, you know? We need to make you some um, 8 by 10 glossies and maybe make a pilot movie and, and get you a Twitter account and away we go. Goodbye, Nazareth. Hello, Jerusalem. And I can kind of, in his brothers, I can kind of see the, the shekel signs spinning around up there in their heads, you know. I think, eh, we may not be anything, but we got a brother that's got a pretty good show. We, you know, he gets on the talent show down there in Jerusalem. Man, this is going to go viral. He's going to be somebody. And we can cash in. They says, says they don't believe he's the son of God. They're showing the view of the kingdom of this world that says if you want to be somebody, then do something for yourself. It's all about you. You're the most important person in the room. You just need to convince everybody else that that's true. Jesus has a different ambition. He has plenty of ambition. Right before this, he took a little boy's lunch and fed 5,000 people with it. Now that's ambition. Oh, and by the way, the little boy doesn't even get his name in Scripture. He gets his sardines and his pocket bread taken away from him and, and shared with 5,000 people, and his name doesn't even make it in there. Why? Well, because he's like everyone else. He gets his identity from God. Once he sets his face to go to Jerusalem, though, it's downhill all the way for Jesus. His ambition was just to do the will of God. His ultimate, ultimate significance is to humble himself, it says, by coming obedient to death, even death on a cross, Philippians 2.8. Remember he said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down myself, John 10.18. And all his life people pushed him to uh, direct his ambition towards himself. And that's all he heard was jump. From everybody, jump, make yourself something out of yourself. But he directed his ambition to the cross and to you. And it says, for, you know, I came to give my life as a ransom for many. There's his ambition. You may have heard the story of Henry Nouwen. Uh, Henry was a priest and a, a scholar, first at Notre Dame, a highly prestigious place, then at Yale. Finally, he held the chair of religion at Harvard, which is like the pinnacle of the temple. This is as high as it gets to hold the chair of religion at Harvard. Everybody knew Henry Nouwen's name. And one day, after really being depressed for a while, uh, Mr. Nouwen decided that he was going to leave that post, resign that post. And he took the post of being the pastor of a house for adults who are uh, mentally challenged in Canada. And everybody said, this is a huge, huge mistake that you're making. How disappointed they were in him. Think of the influence that you will have as the head of chair, the chair at Harvard. Later on, the president wanted him to come and to be his spiritual advisor. And Henry now and said, well, who will take care of the boys? I said, well, anybody could take care of the boys. And he said, no. God has chosen me to take care of these young men. What a wonderful story it is. I had a man one time in my church who was offered a job to move his family to um, another state about 500 miles from here to be in the hub of his um, corporation's uh, city. And uh, he said, no, I don't want to move. I'm going to stay where I am. His boss said to him, he said, you're in your early 40s. Do you realize that you will never get a promotion here? That you will stay where you are for the rest of your life. If you don't take this job and relocate, you will stay where you are at this pay level and in this menial job for the rest of your life. And he said, that's fine with me. He said, because my family's here. My mom and dad are here. My wife's mom and dad are here. And I must do what God wants me to do for my family, and that's to stay here. See? A lot of people saying, jump. Jump off the top. Show yourself to be somebody. Achievement is not evil. Wealth is not evil. Being famous is not evil. But if those things make up who we really are, we're to be pitied. If we gain our identity, we have nothing in them but dust. 
all those things just go away. Jim Elliot said, He is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to gain that which he can never lose. Isn't that a wonderful quote? Give up that which you can't keep to to gain that which you cannot lose. Ambitions of this world are dust. God is forever. Christ is forever. So, the preacher's done. What about me? Hmm? It's, you know, ambitions are weird. It's, it's, they're like everything else, uh, humility and pride. and You can see it in other people, but it's difficult to spot in yourself. It really is. You just can't look at yourself and identify all of your ambitions. But, but I believe that, that uh, God wants us. God wants to speak to us. I'm going to ask us to close this with time of prayer. If you will, please, um, let's just... Um, Put down our phones and our books and our pieces of paper, and let's just have a time of prayer together. Let's ask for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. I have some questions I want to ask. You, you might want to put yourself in a position of receiving, which just means that you just open up your hands on your lap and say, God, okay, I'm ready. Now speak to me. Here's the first question for you. What do you value the most in life? What takes up most of your time and your effort? What are you the most afraid of losing? Is it security, a reputation, a relationship? What do you dream about? In the last and the most piercing, whose approval are you seeking? Is it your peers? Maybe your parents? Maybe your friends? The tens, the nines in the room? Gracious God, you're uh, kind and compassionate, slow to anger, and bounding in loving kindness. You're gentle and meek. You come to us with just a, a small voice. Thank you, Lord, for your word to each one of us today. God, we, we want to seek your kingdom first. We want to seek your kingdom and your righteousness. Lord, we know that everything else will be added to us if that's number one. Lord, that's our desire today.